Your voice looks cold on the first of the month. I said, praise the Lord. The Lord lifts you up. And the Lord brings his power to work more than ever before in your life in Jesus' name. Father, well, thank you at this time and bless your name. Great God, mighty God, loving God. And you sent Jesus Christ to us so that everything we need in life, everything we need to get ready for heaven, you grant unto us through him. Lord, I pray that everyone will be saturated with the blessing of Calvary even today in Jesus' name. Bless your people. And use us to be a blessing to the world around us. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. Can see that we're still talking about Jesus, the all-sufficient Jesus. And we're looking at it because it says, I am Alpha and Omega. Is the one that is from the beginning to the very end. The one that commences with us and then leads us to the consummation and to the climax of what we can be in Christ. That's why we're looking at him from Alpha to Omega, from A to Z. And now we come to him as the uplifter, as the victor, as the one, as the worthy wonder walker that's the u the b and the w and as you complete everything as we learn about this jesus completeness of blessing in your life amen, amen. look at john i'm reading from chapter 3 john chapter 3 we're looking at verse 14 and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so, must the son of man be lifted up. That's why we refer to him as the uplifted one. In verse 15, it says that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. That's why you will not perish. Because you believe on him and you keep on Believing on him, but have eternal life. It's yours in Jesus' name. And we're looking at uh, three things here in the message. Number one, we're looking at Jesus, the umpire appointed to settle all matters with the final sentence. Nobody speaks after him. He speaks and that is final. He looks at your life. He looks at your faith. He looks at everything. And on the basis of your faith, he is the umpire appointed by the almighty God to settle all matters with final sentence. Look at number two. Number two is Jesus, the vine through whom saints Bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Is Jesus is the true vine. The Father is the husband man. And every branch in him, attached to him, depending on him, is through him will bear fruit, will bear more fruit, will bear much fruit. Jesus, the vine, through whom saints bear the fruit of the Spirit. We're looking at number three here he is Jesus, the wonderful who, the wonderful there, that's the name. It's not just the verb, it's the wonderful, the wonder of all wonders, the wonder among men, the wonder even beyond angels, the wonder from eternity, the wonder from eternity to eternity, the wonderful who is worthy to rule or sublime sovereignty. We're looking at number one there. Number one, we're looking at Jesus, the umpire, appointed to settle all matters 
with his final sentence. Anything in your life settled. Everything before you, by you, behind you settled. And when you come on the final day to the presence of God, he will be standing waiting for you there. If you have given your life to the Lord, then he's going to utter the final sentence. He'll say, I bore your judgment. You will not be judged anymore in Jesus' name. Look at John chapter 5, verse 22. For the Father judges no man, but the Father has committed all judgment unto the Son. Look at Acts chapter Acts chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 30 there. It says, and the times of this ignorance. God winged that, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Why? Look at verse 31. In verse 31, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. He'll judge the world, the whole wide world, in righteousness by that man. By that man, all judgment, the final sentence comes from him. He says, by that man whom he has ordained, where, by, whereof, he, he, the God of heaven, has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. This one that was raised from the dead, the risen Lord, the risen Christ, that death could not hold down. He is the one that has the final sentence over all men on earth, all men in every generation, all men that ever live. Look at three things here. We're looking at number one, the upholder of the saved soul and the sanctified sage is scriptural standard. This Christ is the upholder. The upholder of saved souls. The upholder of sanctified saints. The upholder who upholds us is scriptural standard. Number two is the uplifter of subjected saints to secured Heavenly seats. Number three, he is the unifier of all his sheep under his shepherdship through sanctification. Look at number one. Number one, he is the upholder of saved souls. When you are saved, when you give yourself to the Lord, and then you go back to the world to demonstrate the evidence of that salvation, he is the one that upholds it will uphold you. When you say you are sanctified, uh -huh, you are sanctified, and then people push you this way, push you that way, after all, he's, he's sanctified, and they want to test the sanctification, thinking that you will not stand. He is the one that will uphold you in that sanctification as a saint in the standard of scripture. It will keep you. It will keep me. Look at uh, the word of God. In Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. I'm reading from verse 10. Fear thou not. Amen. Fear thou not. Can I stand? Fear thou not. Can I live an uncompromising life? Fear thou not. Will I be able to overcome all temptations that come my way? Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. And I will strengthen thee. You need a good amen there. Yea, I will help thee another amen. Yea, I will uphold thee. It says... Whatever comes, whatever wind may blow against you, the almighty God says, I will uphold thee with the right hand 
of my righteousness. He is the upholder. Look at verse 11. In verse 11 it says, Behold, all they that were incensed and furious and angry and, you know, they, they want to you kind of tear you to pieces. All those that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing and they that strive against thee shall perish. Then in verse 12, in verse 12, he tells us, Thou shalt seek them, and shall not find them. Even them that contended with thee, that they that war against thee shall be as nothing, and as a thing of not. Look at verse 13 there. In verse 13, it says, For I, the Lord thy God, will uphold thy hand. The upholder, I, the Lord thy God, will uphold that hand, will hold thy hand, thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Today, it will help you. Tomorrow, it will help you. All your life, it will help you in Jesus' name. Hey, look at look at Psalm one two one. I'm reading from verse seven. There, the Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. How many evils? The Lord shall preserve thee, preserve your life, preserve your soul, preserve the experience of conversion and connection you have with Him, so that the conversion, the salvation will not fade out after the retreat. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 there. The Lord shall preserve thy going out. Amen. And thy coming in. Amen. From this time forth even forever. We're looking at number two there. He is the upholder. Number two, he is the uplifter. The uplifter of subjected saints to secure heavenly seats. Uplifter. Uplifter. We are down, but he uplifts us. He lifts us up. And then he lifts us not just to a higher siege here on earth. He lifts us up to Heavenly places. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 6. And he has raised us up. I like to personalize that. And he has raised me up. And he has raised me up. When you feel you are down, you say, oh me, I am down. Oh me, I am, you know, I'm the lowest in the whole pack. But when you understand what Christ has done, you don't say, oh me, you say, amen. I am lifted up. I thought you'll be as excited as, as, as I am. And he has raised us up together. And made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He makes us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's why it says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, reading there in verse 8. 1 Samuel chapter 2, we're looking at verse 8. It says, He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifted up the beggar from the donkey to search them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. Look at that. You are poor, you are down, you are downgraded, you are downtrodden, but now because Christ comes into your life and because you come into Christ, he raises you up so that you can now inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. You are lifted up. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1. It is there from verse 3. It says he has blessed us 
with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Look at your Bible, Ephesians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Who has blessed who? Me, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Look at number three here now. Number three, he is the unifier. The unifier of all sheep under his shepherd sheep through sanctification. When the Lord saves us, he doesn't leave us an isolated believer dangling in the air somewhere. He makes us to come in the midst of the fold of the flock and he unites us. Unites us not only in doctrine, yes, he unites us in scripture. We cannot be united without the doctrine of the scripture. He unites us in the deeds of the spirit. He works in us. What he does in me, he does in you. And we're united in behavior, in character, in the deeds of our life. He unites us in the dynamism we have in wanting to carry out the great commission. Unity is not something just on paper. Unity is something that works out in our lives. All those disagreeing ideas that anybody may have, it irons all the sharp corners away. It tells us in John chapter 10 verse 16, Another sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Other sheep I have, which are not of this denomination. There are people that think they're their own denomination. You know, they, they are the only people going to heaven. Heaven will be so small. If only one denomination is the one going there. But John said, and I saw a great multitude, which no man could number. And they were singing the praises of God and singing salvation unto our God. And then the, one of the four leaders, angels, uh, living creatures as me, who are these, he says, these are the people that have come out of the trust and the temptation and the tribulation of the world and they have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. It's not one denomination. I have other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold unity. There shall be one fold and one shepherd. Look at verse 17 there. In, sorry, look at uh, John 17 verse 17. In John chapter 17 verse 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Look at verse 21. In verse 21, it says that they all saved and sanctified that they all, they may belong to different denominations, but they are saved. They are not living in sin. And their dynamic nature is so protected from them. And they live holy lives. And their unity does not make them compromise anything. Because the one they are united with is saved also, is also sanctified. And it says that they all may be one. As thou father art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us. Not one outside us. One in us. If somebody has to be united by compromise, they are outside Christ. But when you are in Christ, a new creature, she is in Christ, a new creature, and will not let you, will not ask you to do anything dumb, anything ungodly. Because he is in Christ, and you are in Christ, it says that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. He'll give us that unity in Jesus' name. And look at here now, point number two. Point number two, Jesus, the vine through whom 
Saints bear the fruits of the Spirit. In John chapter 15, reading from verse 1. I am the true vine. There, he introduces himself. He shows himself as the vine. And my father is the husband man. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, every branch in me that beareth fruit. And that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. You understand? Every branch in him, I'm saved. No fruit. Born again, no fruit. I have eternal life. No fruit. Fruit of the spirit. I'm a child of God, but no fruit. It says, your profession is not enough. You must have production, productivity. You must produce fruit because every branch in me that beareth not fruit, it taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, it purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. That's why we're here at the retreat. That's why we're here at the GCK. You've been born again. You'll bear fruit. I will bear fruit. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, it tells us, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, hearing is my father glorified that she bear much fruit. The only way you glorify the father, not by dancing, not by, you know, all those things people do, and they're happy, and they're just, you know, throwing buttocks and throwing, throwing legs and everything everywhere, and they think that that pleases God. And they invite more sins of the flesh. And they invite more activities of the flesh. And when they finish all the throwing buttons, buttocks and uh, throwing things there, they go, to, they go to a private place and the thing they have been throwing, they bring together the works of the flesh. That one doesn't glorify God. It says herein is my father glorified that she bear much fruit so that ye be my disciples what kind of fruit look at uh, look at uh, galatians chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 22 galatians chapter 5 is expecting will bear the fruit of the spirit it says but the fruit of the spirit is love genuine love not erotic love not fleshly love not defiling love, that one is lost. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, fidelity, faithfulness. Verse 23. And then meekness. You are lowly, temperance, you are self controlled. Against such, there is no law. Verse 24. And they that have crucified, and they that are Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affection and the lust. Look at one, two, three things here. Number one, we're looking at the virgin born son of God, making sons of men to become the sons of God. Number two, the veil removing Christ, making us understand the scriptures number three christ is the voice of resurrection who on the last day will raise saints and sinners look at number one number one talking about christ is the virgin born son of god that makes sons of men to become the sons of God. We're looking at Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. It says, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Look at verse 22. It says in verse 22, now all this was done that he 
that it may be fulfilled which was spoken by the of the Lord by the prophet saying 23 behold a virgin a virgin a virgin somebody who had never known any man intimately to be pregnant but a virgin shall be a child and shall bring forth his son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us say that God with us say it aloud God with us I'm not, going to, I'm not going to give up on you. You didn't say the way I wanted it. God with us. Look at this. Somebody had been a criminal. And here is a policeman with him. He'll check himself. It's not going to do the same criminal scene is being doing look at that man that's a policeman with you right there and he stopped doing the if a judge is with you and he doesn't even need a witness he's looking at you and then you do those criminal things sinful things the judge is there when it says god with us we become conscious of his presence and because he's with us we don't do things the people who sin willfully habitually the people who do evil they do not believe in emmanuel god with us they think he's not here you will not know you will not see they are actually practical atheists the people they do not believe in God. They do not believe that God is with them there. God is seeing them. God is listening to every conversation. When you believe that you are born again by this virgin born son of God. And you know that he is Emmanuel. It will check your life. It will check your conversation. It will check the things you do. In the private, if you believe that God is there in the private, if you believe that God is there in the open, it will check everything you do. Emmanuel, God is with us. Emmanuel, God is with me. And that brightens your life and makes you to do what is pleasing unto God, the God with us. Look at number two here. Number two. Is the veil removing Christ, making us understand the scriptures? What you hold in Second Corinthians chapter three. Second Corinthians chapter three. I'm reading from verse fourteen. But their minds were blinded, blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil. On taking away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. It's like, you know, a primary school child reading the research paper of a professor in a very difficult subject. The primary school child, although he can read the letters there, because those theses and those research papers are still reaching with the alphabets of the English language. But that child just reads, just looks, and he cannot understand. The same thing that many people, they read the Old Testament. They cannot find Jesus there. They find the seed of the woman. They cannot, they do not know that is Jesus. And they know when I see the blood, I will pass over you. They don't know that that's the blood of Jesus. They read about I am the Lord that sanctifies you. They can't see Jesus there. They see that the serpent is lifted up. And whosoever looketh on that serpent on brass would live. They do not see Jesus there. They see that a prophet like unto you. 
you I will send and I will give my word unto him and he shall speak my word to you and whosoever shall not hear the word of that prophet he will be taken from, from among the people they reach they do not understand that that is Christ right there. The veil is in their eyes. It's not that, you know, they don't read the Bible. Maybe you'll be reading the Bible, but you don't understand that this is Christ. And the, the scriptures reveal Christ. And the scriptures make us to know that when this Christ comes into your life, it will make a total change. The veil had been there, but then you come to Christ, it says that veil is taken away in Christ. All the veil that covered you, all the veil that stopped you from understanding the scriptures, the Lord will take it away today. We're looking at number three here. Number three is the voice of resurrection, who on the last day will raise the saints and the sinners. We're looking at John chapter 5, verse 25. John chapter 5, verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice. When the dead shall hear the voice, the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Amen. amen. I said amen. amen. And it tells us in verse 28. In verse 28, it says, Marvel not at they not marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are dead, all that are in the graves, shall hear his voice. Verse 29. In verse 29, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. The resurrection will bring up the sinners. They have not been saved. The goodness of the Lord has not come into their lives. And they come to the resurrection of damnation. But the people who are saved, the people who have given their lives to the Lord, they also rise and they come to the resurrection of the righteous. We're looking at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. We're reading from verse 2. In Daniel chapter 12 verse 2. And many of them that sleep. They have died. In the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, those who are born again, and some to shame and everlasting contempt, those who are not born again. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, those who are born again and those who are serving the Lord, and they that be wise, wise virgins, not foolish virgins, and they that be wise shall shine at the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Amen. Point number three then. Point number three, we're looking at Jesus, the wonderful Jesus, who is worthy to rule with sublime sovereignty. Look at Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, we're looking at verse 6. It says, for unto us a child is born at Bethlehem. Unto us a son is given at Calvary, Jerusalem. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, tell me. And his name shall be called, tell me. If you have the Bible, you are looking at the Bible, say it aloud, and his name shall be called, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of is. He is the wonderful. His wonder will come to your life. Look at three things here. Number one, Jesus is the way of salvation to spiritual satisfaction and sonship. 
Number two, Jesus is the word that saves, sanctifies, and strengthens. Number three, Jesus is the washman that washes every soul as white as snow and washes the saint whiter than snow. Look at number one there. Number one, Jesus is the way to salvation and to spiritual satisfaction and to sonship. It tells us in John chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 6. John chapter 14 verse 6. Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man anywhere, no man in any generation, no man in this generation, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the way, the way to salvation and the way to sonship. Look at number two here. Number two, he is the word that saves, that sanctifies, that strengthens. In John chapter 1, reading from verse 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. It's referring to Jesus. Look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it says, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Is Jesus Christ, how do we know? Look at verse 14. In verse 14, and the word became flesh, Christ Jesus and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth it's through his grace you now come and you have sonship as many as received him to them he gave power to become the sons of god even to them that believe on his name. Look at number three there. Number three is the washman. Washing souls as white as snow. And washing saints whiter than snow. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. It says, come now. And let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. As white as snow. As white as snow. You come to the Lord and all the dark areas of your life, all the darkened behaviors in your life, it takes the blotting uh, the, the blood of heaven, the blood of Christ that makes, that has made atonement for us, it washes everything away and God looks at you and says, look at that. He is as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He'll wash you. I said he'll wash you. One thing, as white as snow, the second thing, whiter than snow. We're looking at Psalm 51. And I'm reading here from verse 6 and verse 7. Look at that. Psalm 51, verse 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the eating part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, purge me. Purge me, purge me, and I with Esau, and I shall be clean. Wash me, wash me, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Can he do it today? I say, can he do it today? Can he do it for you? Can he wash you? Can he blot out your sin? Can he make you as white as snow? Tell me, tell me. 
Can he make you whiter than snow? Rise up and tell him and say, Oh Lord, I want to be as white as snow. I want to be forgiven. I want all my sins to be taken away. I want all the things I've done, all the things I've been doing, I want everything blotted out, taken out. I want to be as white as snow. I want to be whiter than snow. Tell him, tell him. Expose to him those dark areas and those black areas. And the Lord today will make you as white as snow. And if you are saved already, the Lord will make you whiter than snow. He answers prayer. Even quiet prayer. He answers prayer. Coming from, you, coming from your heart. He answers prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. He has answered your prayer. He has answered my prayer. Lord, we look up to you. You have the power. You have the purgative. You have the blood of Jesus that washes, that cleanses, that purifies, that purges. Lord, we pray. Do it for everyone in Jesus' name. Make us clean on the inside. White on the inside. Pure on the inside. Whiter than snow on the inside. And we pray, Lord, that our utterances, words will change. Our language will change. Our dressing will change. Our character will change. Our behavior will change. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And as you make us white as snow on the inside, whiter than snow on the inside, it will reflect in our character. And we pray you grant everyone godly character. Everyone Christ-like character. Not only today, every day of our lives. Thank you, Lord. Say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.